Well, welcome to another Sofa Sermon. Glad that you could be a part of this one. Uh, as we continue in our series on Messiah, I'm finding myself being challenged uh, to go to the Gospel accounts and try to read familiar stories with a fresh set of eyes. And uh, boy, I've been blessed by the, the opportunity I've had to study this and to try to to kind of uh, disseminate some of that information and bring it down and share kind of the essence of what the Lord's been showing me uh, through all of this. Uh, today we're going to talk about something in John chapter 5. Before we get into it, though, I want to mention an account that happened a few chapters later. In John chapter 10, Jesus is in the same place as the John 5 account. He's in a place called Solomon's Colonnade, which is an area where people would gather, and there were pools there, and the, and the superstition was that if you got in the pool at the right time after the angel made the water ripple, if you were the first one in the pool, there were healing powers. But in John chapter 10, Jesus has this uh, confrontation uh, with the Jews, and, and they say this to him, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. All right, so this, you know, this is accelerating by that point in John 10. Tell, if you're the Messiah, just tell us, just tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. And then he makes this statement, the works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. The works that I do in my Father, in, in, in other words, the proof is in the pudding. And, and it's kind of, you know, it, it goes back to this thing that I've been saying in this series, that there were four ways for me where Jesus demonstrated he was, he was the Messiah. He taught with authority, He healed the sick, He performed miracles, and He proclaimed the kingdom. So this week we're looking at this miracle part. When He performed miracles, it was works done in the name of the Father. And Jesus is saying to these guys, that is... Those works are what tell you that I'm the Messiah. And so as we look at this miracle that today that testifies or demonstrates that Jesus is the Messiah, we go to John chapter 5, and it's this amazing story where they're at this pool called Bethesda. Uh, it's surrounded by these five covered colonnades. John's Gospel tells us it's Solomon's colonnade. And the Bible says there were a great number of people there who were disabled and sick. It lists the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. This was a tough scene. These were people gathered around the pool, hoping to be the first to get in the water when the angel restored. But there is a, a large number. Uh, I've heard some pastors say and read some others estimate that there might have been several hundred people uh, gathered around. So this was not uh, an easy scene to be a part of. Uh, it was a place of suffering and hopelessness and despair. And Jesus steps into the scene and He finds out that one of the men that is there is someone who has been lame, who has been an invalid, is the way the Bible says it, for 38 years. For 38 years. And it says when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in that condition for such a long time, he asked him, get the question, do you want to get well? Crazy question. And the man doesn't answer yes or no. He says, sir, I have no way to be the first in the water when the water's stirred. I have no one to help me. And Jesus just goes right on to the next thing, and He just says to him, you know, get up, you know, rise, pick up your mat, and walk. And He was cured at once, and He began walking around. But the problem was, this is where we get to the issue in this story a little bit, was this miracle took place on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to carry your mat on the Sabbath. And so, the, you know, the religious leaders say to Him, hey, look, it's the Sabbath. The law forgives for you to be carrying your mat around. And he replies, but the man who just healed me, he told me to pick up my mat and carry it. And so, you know, they start asking him, and it ends up being th this whole story. And so, on a sofa sermon, I want to get right to the crux of the matter. If I were going to give this a title, it would be this, The Man, The Mess, and The Messiah. I'm not the first to call it that, I'm sure. But So the man, what, what do we know about the man? For 38 years he had suffered. I mean... I don't know about you, but I can go five days with allergies and I'm done with the suffering. I can go, you know, a week with flu. Type I had type A flu two or three years ago, and that was awful. And the medications made it worse, and you know, all these things that happened. Can you imagine being in his condition for 38 years? And he was trapped by this kind of superstitious mindset that was prevalent there at that time. So there's the man, desperate hopeless, stuck in a superstition that says only the first that gets to the water gets healed, and he can't move. He, he's crippled. He, he can't even do it. 
And the one thing that he needs to be able to do is the one thing he can't do to get healed. So he is hopelessness compounded on top of hopelessness. And then there's the mess. What, what was this scene? A large number of disabled people, it says in Scripture. Uh, we can put a picture up on the screen of what Solomon's colonnade looked like. And, and as early or as late as in the 1950s, they were still digging up parts of this, and they believe it to be this colonnade that have five porticos, these kind of columns with little roof structures that overlooked uh, these rectangular pools uh, that were there in the scene. But for them, it was superstition. I don't know if you've ever encountered superstition. One time when I was in uh, about eighth grade, my best buddy and I uh, were being driven by his mom over to the closest town that had a skating rink. So Wills Point to Canton uh, was 10 miles. And for whatever reason, his mom kind of took a back road. So we're going down this kind of back road, frontage road, and we're just a mile or so from the skating rink and a black cat ran out in front of her. She put the brakes on. She turned that car around in the bar ditch and headed back, and it took us like 20 extra minutes to go this other way so that she wouldn't cross paths with a black cat. Listen, I don't know much about superstitions. I'm not a superstitious person, I don't think, but for some people, they drive the economy. And for these people, part of the mess was that they were superstitious, and it was driving their whole existence of being able just to get in the water. So the second part of the mess is this, the Jewish leaders. Isn't it sad? Isn't it sad? A man who had suffered for 38 years, and he's told by someone, if you'll just pick up your mat and walk, you'll be healed. And he does it, and then he gets in trouble for carrying his mat because it's done on the Sabbath. I mean, they couldn't see the man for the mat, right? They, they were less excited about the miracle than they were about keeping religious tradition. That's a mess. That's a mess that Jesus confronted over and over and over. Religion always is more interested in rules and regulations than it is in people's hearts. We need to hear that as a church always, that our first goal are people's hearts and not so much the rules and regulations. So they saw the mat, not the man, uh, and they couldn't embrace his excitement over being healed because he had violated one of the rules, which was you can't carry the mat around. And into this scene comes the third point, which is the Messiah. Have you ever wondered what his voice sounded like? Have you ever thought what it would have been looked like to look into his eyes, to see the compassion, to see the power, to see the clarity of thought, to see him look at someone suffering and heal them and hear the tenor of his voice? Jesus is the amazing Messiah. And he comes onto the scene and he's saying to everybody, listen, this is the Living Bible Translation. The proof is in the miracles that I do in the name of the Father. These are what declared him to be the Messiah. And so as we come to this week's message, I can't help but think of our own church and our own people in, in our community that I encounter from time to time. What about you? Is there a part of your life that it feels like it's gone without healing for far too long? Maybe it hasn't been... 38 years, but it's been three years. Maybe it hasn't been 38 months, but it's been three months. Maybe, maybe it's just felt like, like, God, when are you ever going to do something about this? So we just pray for all of our friends who are struggling with illness and situations and relationships that just have lacked the healing and wholeness that all of us would want in those situations. And we pray for the Savior to walk by. And in the midst of all the humanity, in the midst of all the crowd of needs, that he would stop by and say to one of our friends, rise, take up your mat, and walk. And so we pray for Jesus to come. So thank you for listening again. I hope you'll tune back in on Monday when uh, what is preached live in Common Ground is released in its full version. We pray blessings for everyone. We're so grateful that things are beginning to get back together. If you're still at home, we just want you to know that we miss you and love you. And uh, hope that things are getting better soon for you. We're able to come back to worship also. And meanwhile, blessings for a great week. We'll see you again soon. <music>